afternoon on Wacken the Droids. Thank you. So I uh, stole the title from John Corbett. Uh, he doesn't seem too upset about it yet, anyway. Uh, this isn't, I, I'd been actually very happily ignoring this ascend blocker debate for about a year and a half, actually, and was prepared to ignore it indefinitely, actually. But uh, we, uh, IBM joined this uh, consortium called Lenaro, which is interested in Linux and ARM. And of course, Android uses a Linux kernel that runs mostly on ARM. And so I figured that uh, I had to end my uh, self-imposed isolation from it. And, and all I can say is, like it says there, you know, this is a really small thing to cause so much trouble. I mean, if, if, you, if you look at LKML, there's been, there were flame wars in uh, late 2009 and uh, early 2009 and in 2010, multiple of them. It was, uh, and without any real seeming resolution or forward progress of any kind. But uh, I guess these days, uh, I mean, my, in my day, to cause any trouble at all, you had to have a room full of equipment when I was younger. And I guess today, you know, big trouble would come in small packages. I think I've presented this before, but I think it really bears repeating, especially when you think in terms of uh, the Android experience. How many people have know what the parable of the six penguins and the elephant is? Okay, we got one. Okay, very good. So, uh, as I've said before in this forum, I'm actually a recovering proprietary program programmer. Uh, I was actually doing a little bit of proprietary programming my first year or so at IBM. And before that, it was almost all proprietary programs. So I can really identify with this guy here. You know? So he's got this thing. He knows exactly what it is. He knows the requirements. He knows what he has to do. He's going to get it done on time, under budget, on schedule. No problem. There he is. He's got the problem solved. And the problem is, Sooner or later, sooner or later, the rest of the problem is going to make itself known. And when that happens, it might be painful for both the penguin and the elephant. And I've been there. I mean, I've, I've, I've lived that. In 1996, I thought I knew everything there was to know about RCU. And in the last 10 years, I've proven myself pretty thoroughly wrong. Now, the thing is, this may be somewhat controversial for some of the people, but I'm here to tell you that open source programmers aren't any smarter than proprietary programmers. I'm not any smarter for being part of the Linux community. In fact, you know, look at my hair color, right? It's just, <laughs> this is not correlated with uh, quickly moving, moving brain cells. So they're just as confused. You can see they're all over the elephant. They've got different ideas of what's going on. But there's one really critical difference. One really critical difference between the proprietary and the open source experience. These guys are going to get together. And when they do, it's going to be just another day on Linux kernel mailing list. <laughs> <laughs> We've all seen these. I've participated in a few. The saving grace is that sometimes, not always, not always, sometimes what happens is they actually listen to each other as well as talking. And they achieve consensus. And sometimes that consensus actually has some relation to what, what real is going on in reality. When that happens, they can come up with a solution that really works for the entire elephant. And if I hit the right thing and kept it there, we would be on the same slide throughout. And sometimes it's happened quite often, really. We've had things that have worked really well. We've had cases where a single mechanism worked for mainframes doing uh, virtualization and also for battery-powered ha uh, battery handhelds. Uh, dynamic ticks, for example. There's been a number of things like that where a single technical solution survived, uh, served a very surprising range of different users in different environments. The problem is, with some of the Android features, we seem to be really stuck right there. You know, a year and a half, two years, and there's not really been any progress. They're still yelling. A little bit, you know, there's been a little bit of movement, I suppose. But uh, it seemed that maybe it'd be worthwhile to try to dig in and see what was going on. 
So to talk about uh, how to go about this, I'm going to ask a question to kind of get things started. We're going to talk about uh, there's a lot of different kinds of flame wars. And if you want to try to get requirements for a flame war, which is what I was trying to do, there's this flame war, and I wasn't even sure what the heck the Andrew guys wanted. All right? And other people didn't seem to understand either. And so the idea was to go through and try to figure that out. But you need to choose which flame war you pick. You need to understand what you're trying to do. You need to do a bunch of homework. And then you need to actually analyze the flame war. We'll have some example uh, passages taken from the flame war. I'm not going to identify the people. There are some people that are closely associated with Linux Conf AU that do this very well. I'm not one of them. So I'll just stick with the text and let you figure out the you know, Google. If you really care, you can use Google, right? And then some lessons I learned in going through this. Any, any answers? Why the heck do people flame? What are they doing that for in the first place? Because it's fun. Because it's fun. Okay. Any others? An evolutionary trait. I didn't quite hear that. An evolutionary trait. An evolutionary trait. That could be. I never really thought of it that way. Uh, any any guesses to how that would help? Male, male aggression. I mean. Male aggression. Male. Okay. Verbal male <laughs> aggression. I thought it was a female or more verbal actually, but I'll I'll bow to your knowledge on that. We got the, he's, he gets first there. The answer is so obvious, and yet you don't get it. It's, the answer is so obvious, and you don't get it. Yeah. I think that fits in with that last cartoon there with them screaming at each other. Yeah, that's true. People just promoting their own baby. People promoting their own baby. It's easier to tell someone they're an idiot when they know about the Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get you after we, we'll get to you. We'll get to you. It's, it's uh, maybe they've been working in, in a particular area for a while and some newbie has just posted a giant patch set that completely changes everything and contains so many different mistakes. So old versus new kind of thing. Yeah, a little bit of contention with old versus new. Of course, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> it's much easier to insult someone when they can't directly punch you in the face. It's certainly safer, I'll agree with that. Yeah, it's much safer, so you're <laughs> people are much more likely to do it if there's a slight tendency. Any others? So what I did was I actually posed this question face-to-face -face with uh, somebody who will go nameless, but uh, uh, is quite adept at flaming, let's just put it that way. His answer was to make people go away. In other words, and it's fairly closely related to several people's things there. When, when it got to the point in conversation where he couldn't see a way to resolve things, but he wanted to start getting work done again, he'd start flaming, so they'd go away and he could do whatever he was going to do, for good or for bad. So that was, that was you know, from the, from the flamer's mouth, uh, take it or leave it. So the first thing you've got to be careful of, if you want to go and look at a flame war and try to see what technical realities might be behind the flamage, you want to choose the flame war. You have to be kind of careful about this. If the flame war has only been going on for a couple hours, you're going to have to know quite a bit to have a chance of doing something in time. Uh, because if it's only going to last for two hours, you have to go, do a, go spend a week studying. Uh, it'll be over before you do that. And and that might be useful later, but it's not going to help with that particular flame war. Um, in addition, uh, it, it, you're going to have to study a lot. You have to know quite a bit about it. You have to be able to react in real time to what people are saying. And that takes quite a bit, knowledge and skill. On the other hand, if the flame war has going, been going on for a long time, you might make quite a bit of progress just by stating the participants' positions in a neutral tone. And also, if the flame war is two years old, and it's gonna, you're going to spend a couple weeks studying, so what? Right? The, the time spent studying ends up being negligible. And it took me a few weeks to go through things. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, again, it was it had been recurring. We've been gone for a long time. And so going and spending that time wasn't a problem. It was really obvious when I took a look at the messages that people were talking past each other. They had no e idea what each other was trying to do or what each other was trying to say. And the more that's happening, the more you have a flame war where people are screaming past each other, the more help they need. Of course, you can't expect them to welcome the help. All right? Uh, there's a, you know, uh, 
What's well, a, a saying uh, as the, the paradoxical commandments is actually there's a really cute set of 10 things this guy came up with. Uh, one of them is people really need help, but may attack you if you help them. Help them anyway. And uh, so what that means is that you're going to need a thick skin, okay? Yeah. I've looked on uh, eBay, but I don't know where to buy a thick skin. <laughs> Worked on, looked on eBay, you don't know where to buy a thick skin. Yeah, where, where, where I get one. Where do you get one? Um, one really good way to do it, I, I think, would be to hang on L, out on LKML for a while. <laughs> I don't know. It's uh, I've I, I guess it's I've my thins my skin's got thicker over the years. So maybe when your hair is the same color as my mine is, you'll be in great shape. So know your goals. What are you trying to achieve? Why are you even bothering? Why why not just let them flame each other and get your work done? If your goal is to have fun, you're probably just being another flamer. And there's not necessarily anything, oh, go ahead. Not necessarily anything wrong with that, but that's not the subject of this talk. Flaming for fun and profit, I'll leave to others. Yeah. But you might, <clears throat> but you might be a better flamer. Might be a better flamer, that's true. <laughs> How do you rate flamers? So the so so it's a number of quotes of the Nicholas News, and that's okay. Very good. We have the uh, down here, please. We get this guy as his exercise. <laughs> He's young; he can handle it. <laughs> well, the obvious answer is Scoville units, the measure of temperature of chilies. Yeah, Scoville units. Okay. All right. So if you have a, a quarter million Scoville units, that's a that's a quarter power flame. Okay, so the things I can imagine, these are the goals I can imagine would be reasonable. I mean, so having fun, I don't have a problem with having fun. I really don't have a problem with people flaming, actually, as long as, as long as it's not something that's causing trouble, I suppose, as long as they aren't flaming people who don't want to be flamed. One thing is just learning more about it. Maybe the topic is of interest and, and it's some excitement about it, and maybe learning more about it would be a good thing. Might be you want to understand the positions of the various flamers. You might want to present a neutral view of one of the positions. You know, uh, it's not unusual that somebody who's flaming is their own worst enemy. They're they're talking about what a position that might be reasonable. But you read this email, your your skin crawls every time they say something you agree with, right? Uh, and so sometimes just taking and stating it in a neutral tone can do wonders. You might want to advocate for one of the positions. Of course, doing that and not flaming is a challenge, but you know, what's life without a challenge? You might want to present a neutral view of all of the positions. Um, I've done that a few times uh, in, the, in the long past, and it often can produce quite a bit of progress. You might want to present a neutral view of the positions along with a critique of each, and this does take uh, more skill than the previous one. Uh, people might not react as well to critiques as they might. And you might really want to go the full distance and propose a solution that actually satisfies all the participants' needs and goals and wants. But sometimes just presenting a neutral view of all the positions will get somebody else to figure this out. Uh, somebody who's been involved in it and understands it much better than, than I would say coming in as an outsider. In this case, though, what I was trying to do was present a neutral view of one of the positions, namely the Android one's position, because I didn't know what the heck they were looking for, and from the email, didn't like anybody else did either. You have to do your homework. And again, the shorter the flame war, the quickly, more quickly you have to do this homework. In my case, I was lucky I had a few weeks that I could spend to do that. And the, what prompted this, actually, again, was joining Lenaro. And so suddenly I had to pay attention. It was Linux and ARM. Textbooks are good if, they, if there are any that apply. Um, if it's something that's cut and dried and it might be in a textbook, there's probably not much flaming going on about it, but it can happen. Uh, data sheets and technical websites can be really helpful. See what the stuff, what technology is really doing. 
A lot of time, the flaming involves misconceptions about the technology. And sometimes uh, throwing out a few hard facts can quell the flames and get a solution. The ax grinding. Um, it's usually not helpful to point out the ax grinding. That just gets people more upset. But sometimes it's helpful to understand what axes there are and how they might be in ground so that you can present a neutral view despite that. And then it's time to read the flame war. This takes a long time. I probably spent time, 10 times as long reading each message as it did for the guy to write it. It's kind of a thing like, OK, I know this person. I know they're reasonably intelligent. What on earth caused them to write this? OK, or this other thing was so obvious, it looks like it matches this guy's already guessed it. What, what's going on here? What, uh, what, I would, what do you do when you do that? You have to keep some notes. You have to do some paperwork. So sometimes uh, you look at this and why is this guy saying this? Well, there might be two or three reasons that may sound stupid, but write them down. Write them down. Because you can keep a list of that and then you see a message later and you go back and refer to that. And if you keep that in a small area, it can help you over a period of messages build up an idea of what this guy is really thinking. What he might understand you don't. What he may be missing that uh, would help resolve the problem. So another thing is to keep a written log of the technical content. In other words, if you come across a message that's pulling in something new, keep a URL to it. Write it down somewhere so you can find it again later. These flame wars will go for hundreds and sometimes thousands of messages. And so having to go in and find this one message, oh, there was something that, oh, I see, there's something that was this. Where the heck is it? You know, being able to writing that down and keeping a track of it is, is good. And avoid taking sides, which is always harder than it looks. But it's important. I didn't find any data sheets or te textbooks, but uh, there were some of the Linaro folks that really brought me up to speed on uh, how different uh, embedded is. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in a few slides later. But uh, this is not your father's server. This is not your father's desktop. This is not your father's laptop. This stuff is different. Uh, data sheets were helpful, as well as a number of LWN write-ups. I'm going to have a slide that just lists them out, which uh, the slides that will be put up, I, I don't expect you to read them here. And of course, read the flame war messages. I think I ended up uh, with about 1,600 lines of commentary that I wrote based on the messages. And so there were a lot of messages. There have been a lot of flaming. And uh, that's not counting the actual requirements I was writing down along the way. And uh, well, looking through the slide set later, this is a place to get some background information on this whole thing. So it turned out I had some relevant experience that I hadn't expected. Um, it's energy efficiency. Um, I'm not going to go through in detail what this is, but we thought we had uh, Dyntic idle set up so that the kernel worked really well. In other words, the CPU goes idle, it goes in Dyntic idle mode, there's no schedule clock interrupts, and go into deep sleep, and everybody's happy. And I thought that until early last year, early 2010, and I got a rather angry call. This guy was really upset. He was working on a project he didn't want everybody to know about, so he called me on my phone rather than emailing or anything like that. He was really angry about how RCU was burning his battery life. This is after we put everything to sleep and we you know, went through all this idleness stuff and everything, and he still was upset. To see that, we'll, we'll go through a little bit of a diagram of what's happening. So we have two CPUs. He had a dual core handheld battery powered device. So we've got the first CPU on the top, and on the bottom, time is advancing from left to right facing the screen. So what would happen is that uh, CPU 0 would get done with doing what it's doing. The red boxes are where the CPU is actually actively doing something. Green is where it's in dynamic idle with the CPU presumably powered off. And so green is good here. And what was happening is CPU 1 would uh, go along and do something, and then it would get to this point. It would be done processing, but it'd have some RCU work left to do. So it would stay alive for a couple ticks. It's yellow here. It's not really doing much, but, it, but it's having to take the schedule clock interrupts to get the DRCU do work, work done. And only here would it finally turn the second CPU off. This guy was upset for a few milliseconds of extra processing happening every once in a while. This was reducing his battery life. These guys, uh, you know, the old thing about the uh, performance benchmarkers, killing for 5%. Well, these guys will kill for 5% battery life. 
If they get 5% more battery life, they'll do amazing things to get that. And his argument was, look, RC is not doing anything anywhere. So, you know, you're an American, for Christ's sake, act unilaterally and just shut everything off like this. That's what he wanted. So he wants, as soon as this thing, he wanted this thing to figure out that nothing was happening on their CPU, therefore it can immediately figure that out and shut everything down and not, and not keep the uh, CPU alive for the extra little while. So I actually did that. He never did test it, but some other people did, thankfully. And that was there, but uh, that was kind of a first hint that, uh, you know, I, I've been doing servers for a long time, and we now have energy efficiency as a hard requirement. But the guys in the battery-powered embedded arena don't merely have energy efficiency as a hard requirement. They have energy efficiency as a fundamentalist religion. <laughs> okay? So if you're doing servers, laptops, and desktop, you may think you understand energy efficiency, you don't. I'm sorry, you don't, all right? If you think you do, you don't. <laughs> Too bad. Here's kind of an idea of what they're up against. You might have an embedded, you have a server, might be 100 watts per socket, full bore, low power, maybe 10 watts. If you have an extreme low power server, you might get down to 2 watts per socket, and this will be decreasing over time. That's kind of a snapshot a little bit ago. High power embedded, you know, embedded running full power with a fairly hefty CPU, might be 500 milliwatts. So as you can see, we're a couple orders of magnitude below the, uh, the, the server, more than two orders of magnitude below the high power server at this point. If you have, in low power mode, the CPU is still running but not doing much, 20 milliwatts. And the thing is, a lot of these devices have a battery lifetime requirement that implies an average pa power consumption of 500 microwatts which is a lot smaller than 20 milliwatts, and really a lot smaller than 500 milliwatts. Okay, so they're making this thing operate. It's doing useful work. An MP3 player, for example, is going to be playing music while using three orders of magnitude less energy than the CPU would if running full bore. How do they do that? Anybody know? Yeah. Uh, we need to give them the microphone, sorry. I shouldn't say yeah so fast. Sorry about that. The key word's average. I, I assume mm -hmm. it means it's got to leap into life and do something and then sleep again. Yep, so that's exactly right, but it's, but it's actually playing music the whole time. Yeah. You end up needing to turn off a lot more than just the CPU as well. Mm -hmm. you, there's a whole bunch of buses, a whole bunch of other stuff on that mm -hmm. chip that can be pretty power hungry, so you need to turn them off as well, which can be tricky. Oh yeah, okay, and then that, let's, let's take a look. Okay, so we got a bunch of stuff. All the, all the little boxes there are things that can be powered independently. And on a typical system on a chip, there'll be maybe 20, 30, 40 different chunks of electronics that can be powered down individually. As the gentleman here said, uh, actually doing that and having the thing still be alive when you're, when you're done can be tricky, but you can do it. And that's what these guys do. So the trick is that um, people here understand how many people don't, how many people understand what scattergather DMA is? Okay, so uh, what it is is that you, is, when you have a device, instead of just saying DMA from here to this place on the disk, you give it a big list of things to do. You know, from here to here, put it over there, from here to here, put it over there, and you just give it a big list, and the device sucks it up and, and spews it all out, and it allows you to get a lot more I.O. done without having to copy stuff back and forth in memory, or without having to have separate I.O.s for each one. These guys take it a step further. They add a time component to that. DMA from here to here right now. The next thing in the list, in 500 milliseconds, DMA from here to here. 500 milliseconds after that, DMA from here to here. The thing is, the CPU doesn't have to be around at all for that to happen. So they can have the, if they were playing back MP3, they could have the memory actually containing the MP3 data powered up, the other four, three banks powered down, the audio powered up because it's actually playing, and they could have the antenna in case it's also a cell phone and you want to get an incoming call. The CPU is powered down, the vector unit as well, the cache SRAMs have been flushed to memory and powered down. Any memory that's in the three banks has been pushed out to flash, which is also powered down. The display and the backlight are turned off. So 
The reason that it can average so much less than the CPU is the CPU is not doing anything. We actually have hardware assist doing these DMAs periodically. So what happens if we look at what's, gonna, what's going to happen as we go forward through time, this is kind of just shows the data flowing through the system. From flash, the CPU is going to wake up, maybe decode it, throw it in, in DRAM. That decode may be hardware, but let's assume we got a stupid one. Uh, then the CPU sets up the copy, and then once the copy goes, it just pushes it out to the speakers. If you have MP3 decode, the CPU will be powered down for minutes. Up to about three minutes, I think, is what you get with high-end devices. Just totally powered off. The thing will be playing music that whole time. It'll wake up, dump the rest of the data in, turn itself off, and keep going. So the power would look like this. So we have time going from left to right and power consumption going up. So we would load the buffer. We would put, put a memory in that first chunk of memory in, in bank zero. And then we would go and power, the, uh, power things down. We'd wait for a while. Then we'd have to load the buffer again. And then again load the buffer. So what do the green bars signify there? Start and end of a song? No, not quite. That's a good guess, but not start and end of a song. We're going to give this guy some exercise. All right, up the stairs. Good show. Effectively, the power latency around the CPU, you need to power up the CPU before you can use it and then get all the work done before you shut it off again. It takes energy to turn the CPU on and off, exactly. So we're going to load things up. And then we're going we're gonna to take and flush out the caches, turn the memory off, flush things as disk, turn things off, and that takes, consumes power. And then we're going to power things up to do it the next little round. That consumes power again, and so on. Exactly. So let's suppose that we got this guy with a smartphone, and he works for, uh, in, uh, for sound pollution. So he's going around with a little microphone and checking to see if the workplace is sufficiently quiet to be, uh, meet regulations. But he also wants to listen to music while he's doing this. And let's say that uh, it's just going the opposite direction, right? You have music playing from the flash into his ears, and you've got a microphone that's picking stuff up and dumping into flash. So it's just audio stuff going both directions. And they're both heavily optimized. All right, so we've got reading and decoding and playing music, and we've got hearing the uh, humming through the microphone, encoding that, and putting it out to flash in the other direction. What's the problem here? What's wrong? We'll get him. Suboptimal with the power up and off again, rather than batching. Exactly. We aren't batching the stuff. We could. What we really want to do is what's shown here. We want to, if we're going to turn the CPU on, we want to get our money's worth. Turn the CPU on, process the output, also process the input, turn it off, and then keep the intervals where we have the CPU off as long as possible. What this means is that power efficiency is a system-wide attribute. It's not just an application. If you take an application and make it power efficient, that's OK. But if you combine it with another power efficient application, as we saw, you might have something inefficient. So in some sense, it's more challenging than performance programming for parallelism. If you take and parallelize a couple of programs around together, it'll probably do something reasonable. In this case, we can see it's not. OK. But so what this all means is there's a lot of stuff you have to worry about in, in the power, battery power embedded. You don't in servers. And that there's a lot of information you have to pay attention to. Of course, that doesn't mean the Android guys are always right. It just means that there's some more things you have to keep, that I had to keep in mind than from my experience when evaluating it. OK? So let's take a look at a few snippets from the flame war. We'll go through, and let's uh, see what we can analyze them. Let's start with that one. I don't think x86 is relevant anyway. It doesn't suspend and resume anywhere near fast enough for this to be usable. My laptop still takes several seconds to suspend, it's a Lenovo T500, and resume, aside from some user space bustage, takes the same amount of time. That's quick enough for manual suspend, but I'd hate to try it for auto suspend. OK, so this is an argument against uh, uh, why this, the Android stuff is useless for laptop. Any assum hidden assumptions there, any things that you need to keep track of? Get the microphone over there, please. His entire argument is based on x86. And that's that x86 was never designed for power efficiency or fast shut up and speed up and shut down. Mm -hmm. 
We got one down here, please. Depending on how you look at it, neither was ARM. ARM was a desktop chip. It just happened to be a rather nice one to convert for power use. There's also, um, particularly on older ones, the 500 is probably new enough not to have it, but lighting a screen mm -hmm. takes time, especially if it's a fluoro lit. Mm -hmm. Okay, up there, and then we'll catch in the back there. So he's he's basing his uh, his assumption on on that there's something in the system that's slowing down suspend, maybe user space, for example, um, and so he's basing his assumption on that user space will never be fixed, user space will never suspend fast, mm -hmm. and so there's no point in actually fixing the kernel itself. Mm -hmm. That's certainly a thing there. We we had the gentleman in the middle here was well okay whichever. <laughs> Um, it also assumes that um, the full suspend and resume as implemented on the XX6 is the most power efficient. You could use C states or something else would be some, perhaps more similar to um, what's uh, usable for the, uh, for the Android. Okay, so depending on the hardware you might have different strategies that are going to be there. The gentleman in green in the middle there. I see some requirements of um, they're expecting this suspend and resume to be under seconds. So I would be pulling something like that as a requirement. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so those are some good points. One key thing is that they're assuming, see, with an, with an Android, the suspend is very quick. It's noticeable, you can see it, but it happens sub-second. And they're assuming that uh, if you were to apply this to a desktop or server, you'd be using suspend and resume for the same thing that you're using it for an Android. And that might be true, but maybe there'd be other things you might use it, use it for. Let's try another one. There is no solution besides suspend blockers. I, I kept the misspelling, it was, it was too much fun. <laughs> there is no solution besides suspend blockers. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> what was the problem? <laughs> Yeah, I fundamentally, the, the author, I'm going to say he, in a bold assumption, has um, assumed that their problem is the lack of suspend blockers. Mm -hmm. and, and from the, that point of view... Yep. Yeah. I've not thought of anything else besides suspend blockers, so there must not be anything else. Solutions to the problem already exist. This was some, by somebody who didn't particularly like the Android approach and was saying we can order, you know, essentially outside of Android we have solutions to this problem. I think the uh, part of the, the sentence they haven't finished there is, and I've already told you what they are. <laughs> yeah, that, that showed up in other messages, you're right. <laughs> It's again a question of you know, are we talking about the same problem? And secondly, there's an, an implicit assumption that we have the best solution already. Yeah, and the solution's adequate for everybody. It's good for me, so it should be good for you, right? Yeah, uh, he believes he understands the problem, and uh, you know, who knows? Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. I certainly didn't understand the problem before I started when I was going through there. I still don't see how blocking applications will cause missed wake-ups in anything but a buggy application at worst, and even those will eventually get the event when they unblock. So this is by somebody who, does, again, doesn't like the Android approach. So, uh, go ahead. Therefore, obviously, you're not as smart as I am. <laughs> That's certainly implicit in a lot of these, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, the, the one thing is the guy, he, he says it's buggy. Well, what's buggy mean? Okay. I mean, if I have an application that gets a segfall, is that buggy? Well, it might or might not be, depending on what the application is trying to do. You know, it's one way of measuring how much memory I've got already is go until I got a segfault. And the other thing is, is it really okay for the event to be delayed? How long can it be delayed? What can the application tolerate? So again, it's kind of, do they understand the problem? 
So I'm gonna, I think we've uh, gotten the general gist of these. There's some more that uh, in here. But uh, just some things that uh, kind of hit on me when I was going through this. You know, it's not enough to listen to what the people say, all right? As, and, we, and I think you guys understand that from your uh, picking apart the various messages. You have, to, you have to work. The thing that requires the work is to understand what they're thinking, what's behind the words. And to do that, you're really going to have to understand the technology. Uh, because what we were seeing in a lot of these was guys who'd lived in server and guys who'd lived in battery embedded just talking past each other because they didn't have a, neither of them understood what the forces acting in the other guy's arena were. And uh, the thing is, is that, that you could expect that to be a fair amount of work because if understanding the whole problem was easy, there probably wouldn't be a flame war to start with. They would already understand it. These are not stupid people. Okay, we've, made, we've been making fun of them, but these guys are not stupid. All right? Um, and the other thing is that if somebody strongly opposes something, they're probably not going to think much about uh, ways to make it work. They're not likely to come up with a use case requiring that thing they don't like. And uh, they also might not be real happy if somebody else comes up with a use case for it. So there's bound to be a little resistance. And the same thing happens for the, the exactly same thing and the opposite for the guy that's wedded to a solution. They aren't going to think of a different solution and they aren't going to be happy if somebody points up a different solution. So I did come up with a reasonable set of wake locks. I published them LKMO and triggered another weeks long flame war. <laughs> Uh, during which time I refined the requirements, and I think I've got something more or less right. I've, uh, there's a, I'll, I'll show a quick look at them. I ended up with 18 requirements, two nice-to-haves, and three non-requirements. And a lot of those were things I would not have guessed up front. At this point, uh, one of the, one of the, at this point, it seems like wake locks are actually likely to have server desktop uses. Uh, there's something called a RTC, a real-time clock, and all the x86 boxes I see around here. This thing is a timer. It runs even when the box is powered off. So you shut down your, your laptop, your desktop, your, your um, uh, PC, whatever it is, and there's a little clock that goes. And you can make that thing wake the system up even if it's powered off. And if the thing's been powered down, it'll boot it. If it's been suspended, it'll wake it up. It'll resume it. So uh, there's a guy I work with. I was wondering, well, OK, what would you use? I mean, you know, it's kind of like people were saying, you can't use this outside of Android. I'm going, well, what could you use it for? I was coming up empty. I couldn't think of anything to use it for myself. But a guy I work with will says, well, you know, I got the server at home. And uh, I really, I'm really worried about my carbon footprint. So I want it to shut down if I'm not using it. But I don't need it to shut down in a second. If I, it's, it's, you know, after 15 minutes of disuse, it's OK if it turns itself off. And if it takes a minute or so to do, that's fine. But I want it to do its backups at 3 in the morning, whether it's turned on or not. I want it to wake up and do its backups, and then only when its backups are done, go to sleep. And if I start using it, I want it to wake up. And if it takes a second or so to wake up, that's fine. You know, I, it, I don't expect it to be my cell phone. So there might, there might be some more information on this forthcoming. I think he's going to submit an article somewhere or another. And if it, uh, it, it hasn't shown up yet, but uh, I think it'll be showing up soon. And uh, who knows if this is actually a compelling use case. He's excited about it, OK, but, but he's one guy. Uh, I can imagine that things like that might be important, but we'll see. And uh, another thing is, is that if somebody does a solution based on what he wants to do, he's done some things with making, what, what he's done so far is he's, he's got some patches that are on the way to mainline. So you can use the normal POSIX clock functions. You can sort of set a wake up timer as you normally would and have it happen. In contrast, without those patches, you have to know which hardware you're dealing with and you write to a hardware register. And that means you have two different applications that want to wake this thing up at a different time, well, the last guy to write wins. And so that means, so things like, uh, like Myth TV use this. But if you had Myth TV plus your backups, they, they get in a fight and they both lose. So uh, this will have some, I think it'll have some good use cases. Maybe it'll mean that wake locks are needed, maybe not. Um, and if, even if they are, it's going to be an interesting question as to whether the solution you'd get by doing this work would actually satisfy the Android guys. There is some PMQS functionality under development. Um, uh, Raphael Waisaki and Alan Stern have been big working on this. And it's not clear that it's actually going to do what the Android guys need, but it looks like it will make it so that the Android drivers can hit mainline, which would be quite important. That would be a big step forward. So. I mean, legal sponsored that page, and uh, more questions.
Well, if not, oh, woo, okay. So just for everybody playing along who may not be as familiar with the actual flame war that, um, I mean, because we all came along, we know that there's been an Android flame war, but we know it's about these things called wake box, but just a quick precis of, of Android's position, what they actually want. Okay, uh, yeah, what I should do is uh, kind of show what, uh, a quick thing of, if I can get my, so they, uh, what they do is they split applications into two types. They have power oblivious applications, which are things that were just written for the old style PCs that just do something and don't care about power, which are most of them. And then they have some that are, some that are PM driving. In other words, if you, have a, if you start a download in an Android and the download doesn't take too long, what it'll do is it'll continue the download and keep the system awake, <clears throat> even though it would normally, without the download, have shut it off. And then when the download finishes, it shuts it off, or if it times the download off, it's taking long, a little. Yeah, so that's a PM driving one, one that, an application that can control the power state of the whole device. Keep it on when it otherwise go off, shut it off, whatever. Power optimized applications are kind of like that microphone thing where, it, where they work together and make sure that they, they work well. And then uh, we're not worried about the rest of it, it's not that important. Um, the questions I'm not worried about too much at this point. Um, obviously they wanted energy efficiency, that's their whole reason for being. They want to allow power oblivious uh, applications to run on their platform. Their view is that people, when they write things, aren't going to do the right thing with power. It's energy efficiency. It's a new thing, and most people don't know what, it, what to do. But they want people to be able to write those. They want phone users to be able to use them, but they want them to not destroy the battery. Okay? So this is the part that gets the Linux community upset. What they want to do is, even if one of those is runnable, if there aren't any of the power, optim power driving applications running, they want to just suspend it. They want it to suspend itself. And then if something happens, an incoming call, somebody set a timer that goes off, or you hit a, hit a button that wakes it up, they want it to wake itself up, and then those things keep running. So the, the standard application like that might be something that just updates your screen, okay? Um, or just tells you, you know, for example, just here you are right now. And then if you let the display go off, well, obviously you aren't looking at it, so there's no point in running it. That kind of a... Uh, that, uh, logic I just gave is not uh, is at best an acquired taste in some circles. Okay, um, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, you can look them up. Uh, there's just various levels of detail on what you do in various situations. Things about if you're getting ready to power it down and, it, and an event comes up, how do you make it so that it stays awake and doesn't just go to sleep immediately before it hands things off? If you have an event that's supposed to go to a power oblivious thing, what do you do? You, uh, you don't want the thing to stack up in the kernel, and they they handle that and a number of things like that. Um, it's, um, please uh, feel free to take a look at the document, and if you see something funny or uh, needs improvement, please let me know. Yeah. So has anyone outside, someone outside the emitter space done any work using, um, doing more low-level analysis of bigger things, laptops, desktops, big hulking servers, and the wake-ups there. I mean, PowerTop's mm -hmm. one sort of thing, but it's got issues and it sort of seemed that it came out, people fixed a bunch of things, and now Gnome is back to waking up hundreds of times a second. <laughs> so there's definitely two different uh, schools of thought. The Android school of thought is that we want to tolerate uh, applications that aren't really very power optimized. The uh, power top school of thought is if there's something, if an application misbehaving, let's fix it. And uh, until it's fixed, well, the batteries are gonna, gonna have problems. And uh, um, it's, uh, it's gonna be interesting to see what, whether there's, you know, what kind of common ground shows up between those two. But uh, your point, I, I hadn't realized that Gnome was back to waking things up 100 times a second. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, the Android guys would uh, jump on that as uh, evidence for their position, and the uh, PowerTop guys would jump on that as for the people should be more careful. Um, I'll let them fight for the moment anyway. If there are no more questions. Well, uh, after that. 
Paul, thank you very much indeed. In appreciation of thank your you. magnificent talk. Thank you. A little gift, a, a, a miniature of the one that was handed out each morning. <laughs> at the, uh, thank put you. Put your hands together for Paul, please. <laughs>